Greetings Rebels and welcome to another video where we talk tactically about Star Wars Destiny. I'm your host Gray, as always, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the Mulligan. Now I know I've been promising this one for a while, but it wasn't the sort of video that could be rushed. I mean, none of them are, but certainly not this one, what with the math that we're going to be discussing today and all that. And really it's less math and more statistics, and it's really not this big deep dive into it or anything. Although, I'll leave that up to your judgment when you get to the end. It's going to be pretty simple. I'm going to be showing you some charts. And my hope is that after you watch this one, you gain a greater understanding of the odds you have to draw the cards that you want for your opening hand. This will also help you determine, perhaps, how many cards you want to mulligan. And then you'll also know the chances of getting back the cards that you want in your final opening hand. So see, it sounds pretty simple, right? Yeah, it's really not that bad. Well, let's give it a shot, shall we? Go grab a drink and be back in 10 seconds. You don't want to miss this. All right, just so we can start building up the concept here, we need to discuss the basics first. Right now, in the standard constructed format of Destiny, we're allowed to have 30 cards in a deck, a maximum of two copies of any one card in the deck, five cards in her hand, and we're allowed to mulligan up to five cards back into the deck after we see our first five cards. So we're going to start this conversation by focusing on draw deck odds, and I want to highlight that for the purposes of this video, I'm going to be using the words odds and probability somewhat interchangeably as the only difference between them is formatting, and most of the formats that I'll be presenting you here are in a percentage because, well, visually that's just kind of easier. All right, so back to it. For any single card you want to draw from a full deck of 30 cards, the odds of drawing that card are 1 in 30 for any card that has a single copy. Uh, and for the cards that have two copies in the deck from a 30 card deck, the odds are twice that or 6.66%. But this is when we're drawing cards from a full deck. Once we draw a card from the deck, the deck is now 29 cards. So drawing a second card puts the deck at 28. Drawing a third card puts the deck at 27 cards, so on and so forth. And we get to have an opening hand of five cards, right? So because our odds always increase when we add additional copies of cards to the deck, up to the max of two, and because the odds get better of getting the card we want as a deck shrinks, then... The more cards we draw, the higher the chance we have of getting the card that we want, right? Now that may sound complex, but it's about as straightforward as anyone can actually say it. So why is this important? Well, it's important to know because when we build decks, there are often cards we want in our opening hand that help the overall strategy of our deck to get off the ground faster. And knowing the specific odds all the time could help you determine whether you're going to mulligan two cards, three cards, four cards, or all five cards. Now keep in mind, this is all a game time decision, so you can't really linger too long on this, this concept or, or idea of how many cards am I going to mulligan because you're on the clock in competitive play. I usually have about 45 minutes per round. At my local store, sometimes we do 35, you know, depending on the format. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go over to the explanation screen to show you all of this in chart form and present some additional concepts. So before we get into mulligan stats, let's just present the basic five card draw odds for any cards. The chart that you're going to see here illustrates the odds of drawing into your hand cards with single copies in your deck or cards with two copies in your deck. So the top row is one copy, the bottom row is two copies. And both of these statistics are taken from a uh, the starting 30 card deck decreasing down in order. Now in order to get these specific numbers you need to do something called hypergeometric probability. And I'll put a link to a simple calculator for those in the uh, people who are interested in the show notes so that you can try it out for yourself and fiddle around with it. Also, I want to say special thanks to my buddy Zerlik, who is apparently a stats wizard. Sadly, he does not play this game. He still plays Magic. Uh, but he did provide me with some guidance on this particular section and was a big help in constructing this video in general. So let's interpret this a bit, starting with your opening hand. The first card you draw... Uh, is being drawn from a full 30-card deck. From there, the odds begin at 1 in 30 for a single copy and 1 in 15 
for a card with two copies in your deck. And the chart here illustrates the chances of drawing at least one single copy from each draw from the deck when forming your opening hand. And what you can take away from this is that if you have one copy of a card in your deck, say Hyperspace Jump, then the odds of you, that you'll draw it in your opening hand are actually, what the fifth card number is, 16.6%. If you had two copies of Hyperspace Jump in your deck, then the odds of drawing at least one copy is 31%. So for those players who want some precision, there's an easy way to remember this uh, too. At a glance, what you can tell yourself mentally is that for single copy cards, percentage of drawing it starts at about 3.3% and increases by about 3% for each card drawn. And for two copies, it's about twice that, right? 6.6% starting and increases by about 6% with each draw. But most players, generally like things in shorthand, right? Again, this is that game time decision thing, right? So the shorthand here is you can think of it as you basically have about a 15% chance to draw a card that has a single copy in your deck or about a 30% chance to draw uh, any card that has that you have two copies of in your deck. And that makes it easier to remember despite not being entirely accurate, which, which is okay, you know? You're not gonna have a calculator at your game table to tell you this stuff. And at the end of this video, I'll put up a summary slide for all this stuff and everything else that we're going to cover just so it's all in one place. So now, you're probably wondering, well, how does this affect the mulligan exactly, Gray? That's what I'm watching this video for, dude. Okay, calm your horses. We're getting there. Let's go to the next slide, and I'm going to show you some more. Okay, now in Destiny, we have this thing called a mulligan. In fact, most CCGs have some sort of mulligan, and the one in Destiny is similar but different. Some might actually call it generous. And let's talk about why that is. So your mulligan is only limited by the amount of cards that you have in your opening hand. That's right now five cards. You know, maybe in the future they add a plot or something that lets you have six cards in your opening hand. But right now your opening hand is five. So that's what we're going to be working on. So that means that there are actually five initial scenarios that we can talk about. One where you mulligan five cards, another four, another three, and so on. But each time you mulligan, you place the unwanted cards back in your deck, which changes the deck size for the new draw. So the old odds aren't the same, but they don't change a significant amount either. This chart here shows you the odds for a mulligan where you did not get a single copy of any two copy card that you want. If you want the odds for a card that you only have one copy of in your deck, then you can have the values on this chart. You can note, that for the five card mulligan, the odds are exactly the same as on the previous chart because you literally made the deck 30 cards again by returning all five cards you drew to the deck and drawing a new five. Now, what makes the mulligan special is that the cards we keep are now removed from the deck which modifies the deck size itself. And so that's why the odds of drawing a new first card on each of these columns increases a little bit depending on how many cards you kept. The draw after the mulligan is essentially an independent event of the first draw. The deck is now a different size to start with the exception of the five card mulligan. And so the odds of drawing a certain card do change a bit, although you can see the difference is only about, you know, 1% between a five card mulligan and a one card mulligan. Now, again, the exact numbers probably, you know, aren't that helpful to you. So to remember the odds and stuff like this, you can approach it in two ways. You can either think of what is the most common mulligan that I'm going to do, and you can create a guideline for yourself or simply use the average mulligan, which in my opinion is probably three. And that's smack in the middle of the chart, and it makes it easy to remember. Because then you can just remember, well, the odds are 7, 14, and 20. That's the shorthand for three cards uh, two cards kept and three cards mulligan. And really, only the last value on this chart actually matters because it's not like you can stop your mulligan short nor would you want to even if you got the card that you got right uh, that you were looking for so but you know if you're a real go-getter then you can try to remember the mulligan odds across the entire chart and i'll give you the shorthand for that which is 7 15 20 25 and 30. and those are the rough odds for the one two three four and five card mulligan as nice round numbers so combining this information from these last two charts, you can tell yourself this, okay? For any card that I have two copies of in my deck, the odds of drawing it in my first five cards is about 30%. And if I didn't get it in my hand, 
then the jo- odds of drawing it on a three card mulligan are about 20%. And that will probably suffice for most players. All right, so things are getting complicated, right? So the chart you're looking at takes a statement that I just made and tries to show you the actual odds. What this illustrates is the overall chance of drawing a card in both your draw and your mulligan combined. Now, I said the numbers before were about 30% for your initial draw and about 20% with a three card mulligan. And that's probably good enough, right? But for those that want more accurate numbers, well, here you go. Let's talk about what this chart is saying to us. Now, what you have to think, how you have to think of it is this. The more cards we mulligan, the more cards we see. A full mulligan sees 10 cards, for example. They're not necessarily unique cards, but we do see 10 cards. Now, you might want to know the odds of seeing at least one copy of a particular card in your five card draw and your three card mulligan, right? Remember that independently, the rough odds are 30% and 20% respectively. Okay, so you see a total of eight cards in that scenario, right? So what you can do to get a rough value of that is take a look at the extended chart, which also uses the same exact hypergeometric probability that we've been talking about this entire time. And the odds for that would be 46.9 or about 47% to see at least one of the two copies of any given card. And all that we've done here is basically say, what are the odds of seeing that card in eight total cards seen? And doing that math by hand becomes a challenge because again, in each mulligan scenario, the size of the deck changes and the numbers become weird because the mulligan might only exist because you did not see the card that you want in your opening five cards. Then remember that there can be two copies of the card in your deck and it's possible you might actually draw both. Or you might have kept the first copy of a card, lowering the chances to draw at least one copy and you also want to see the second one. And these aren't the extent of the scenarios either. You can think of probably a hundred different mulligan scenarios, but what I'm trying to say is that all these factors actually complicate things quite a bit. And determining the exact math for all those scenarios, while possible, probably isn't as important as just knowing the shorthand stuff. So I'm distilling it down here for that reason. Now, naturally, again, no one is gonna expect you to remember all these values. What you should take away from this is that if you do not get the card you want in your opening hand, then these are the chances of seeing it somewhere between your draw and your mulligan. Think of them like extended odds of drawing a card that I want when there's two copies of that card in my deck. So if you wanna remember the shorthand odds, again, for those go-getters, then you can try to recall the numbers 35, 40, 45, 50, and 55, to remember the rough estimates of the implied probability of drawing at least one copy of any two copy card in your given given deck between a five card draw and a one to five card mulligan. After finishing the script for this video, I decided that it wasn't quite done. I asked myself, well, what more information could I add? And I came up with the idea to include some practical applications for all this mulligan stuff as well. I mean, knowing the mulligan odds is already rather practical in itself, but I wanted to take this time to peek at the meta for a moment and provide the advanced players with a bit more information that they might find useful for their approaches. The decks that I'm gonna be discussing in this next two sections are Kylo FN and Thrawn Uncar, as these seem to be prevalent in the current meta. And this section here is going to deal with how to enhance your odds of calling the correct color for Kylo's ability. Now, as a disclaimer, please be aware that this information isn't going to guarantee two damage each time you activate Kylo, okay? So don't go yelling at me just because you're a bad guesser. What it has the potential of doing, however, is increasing your odds to guess a correct color based on the number theory that we've already discussed and without any prior knowledge of what is actually in the opposing player's hand. All right, so you've been staring at this deck list for a while already, and this is a deck list pulled straight from the Hyperloop's website's gauntlet page, and the link for it is gonna be in the show notes. Since the deck is so prevalent in the meta right now, we're also gonna be discussing this deck in terms of a prospective mirror match. That is, you and the other player are playing the exact same deck list. Again, remember that this is theory, so I need a baseline example to provide a jumping off point, and this is it. So let's talk about Kylo's ability. It reads, 
After you activate this character, you may choose a color, blue, red, yellow, or gray. Then, reveal a random card in an opponent's hand. If that card matches the chosen color, deal two damage to a character. Okay, well, if we know the deck list, we know that yellow's out of the question, so that leaves us with three options. Now, SWDB.com provides us with these handy charts that very few people actually look at, if I had to guess. Most advanced players are probably looking at the card cost chart, if nothing else, but today we're going to actually be looking at the first chart that they give us, which is card types. And this chart provides the color breakdown in the deck list. So in this one, we've got 15 blue cards, 9 red cards, and six gray cards. Now if we plug all that into our hypergeometric calculator, and let's assume for a moment that they keep the five cards they drew, then these numbers are the actual probabilities that the opponent has at least one card of each of these colors in their hand. So for blue, there's an almost a 98% chance that they've got at least one blue card in their hand. There's an 86% chance that they've got at least one red card in their hand and a 70% chance that they've got at least one gray card in their hand. Naturally, since you can only pick one card and you know that half the deck is blue, you'd probably be pick blue anyway, right? But this illustrates just how good a choice that actually is. Let's move on to the next example, which is gonna be about card costs. For this one, we're looking at card costs to improve the accuracy of calling the right number for Thrawn's ability and nothing else. For this example, we're going to be looking at the cost curve for the previous deck that we looked at, which was Kylo FN. So here's the cost curve for that, and here's the breakdown of cards at each cost. And it looks like a very tight spread across cost 0 all the way to 3. And there's no 4 or greater cost cards in this deck. And having a spread like this is actually worse than a more varied spread, simply for guessing the proper number when you don't care about targeting a certain card. And to understand that, let's introduce Thrawn's ability text. And it reads, after you activate this character, you may choose a number. Then look at an opponent's hand and discard a card from it that costs the chosen number. As you can tell, this ability is a lot more advantageous than Kylo's, who is forced to pick one card at random. Guessing the color spread is easy, right? Choosing the right card, on the other hand, that can be pretty hard. But with Thrawn, since we get to see the entire hand, all we have to do is choose a cost. And when a deck's cost curve is perfectly even, then statistically, we have the same chance to be correct no matter what cost we choose. And because of the nature of this ability, the cost curve mulligan probability becomes exactly the same as our odds to be correct. And here's the breakdown on that one. And I'll say it in case you just went blind. The odds of calling a cost and there being at least one card at that cost in their hand is 89% for zero cost cards, about 82% for one cost cards, and 70% for two and three cost cards. Keep in mind, none of these, in none of these examples, this one or the one in the previous section, take into account mulligans in which players see more cards, which we talked about earlier. And the big highlight to recall there is that seeing more cards can increase the odds of seeing the card we want and then keeping it. So with Thrawn, it helps to know the meta well to improve your chances of guessing a card cost in their opening hand. However, it helps even more to know about this practical application in the event that you get to see your opponent's deck list and can plug it into swdb.com prior to the big event that you're participating in. You can just take a look at the cost curve to get an idea, right? But you may also want to note that there are some more important cards in someone's deck that lie along a particular cost on the curve, such as maybe zero or one for removal cards, or two for vibro knife for ancient lightsabers, or something else that you might want to remove. So obviously that goes deeper into the meta than this particular practical application. I'm just showing you how great of an, of an application the hypergeometric probability can be if you're just looking at card costs and you just want to guess a correct cost. Now that we've gotten through it all, how do you guys feel about this stuff anyway? You know, personally, I feel like it's pretty useful for those who want to take their game to a higher level, and I recognize then that that isn't everyone, and certainly not everyone who might have actually gone through this video. But anyway, 
I wanted to provide you guys with a brief summary of what we covered so that it's all in one neat screen that you can refer to whenever you want. So we started by talking about basic draw odds from a 30 card deck. We talked about the odds of drawing a card from a deck that include a single copy or two copies. Roughly, the odds to draw only one copy of the single copy card is 15%, while the odds to draw at least one copy of any card with two copies is about 30%. Next, we discuss the isolated mulligan odds at all levels of the mulligan, from five cards to one card. We determine that the odds here start around 7% uh, and increase all the way to 30%. And a shorthanded way to remember the odds for each card you take goes 7, 15, 20, 25, 30. Then we put it all together and gave you the rough odds for a typical scenario to start the game. Again, we looked at the odds across the mulligan and the card draw and combined them to give you the rough odds of drawing at least one copy of any card in your deck. The shorthand here became 35, 40, 45, 50, and 55. Lastly, to wrap it all up, I dove into some practical applications and how to use this stuff mid-game with Kylo and with Thrawn. We discussed one particular Kylo FN de uh, deck list from the Hyperloops, and we pitted it against itself and presented just how accurate Kylo can get at guessing based on the color curve of that deck. I then took the cost curve from the Kylo FN deck and pitted it against the Thrawn Uncar deck and took a look at how accurate Thrawn can be at using his card cost calling ability. And there it is, all there for you. Please feel free to refer back to the individual sections to refresh your memory on the stuff. And if I'm feeling lucky, I might even put timestamps for each section in the show notes. All right, well, folks, I hope it was helpful to watch this video. I knew it was going to be very long, and so I wanted to make certain that the information presented here was going to be impactful to you. One of the reasons that I took so long to get this one out had to do a bit with understanding the hypergeometric probability and as I dove back into it I actually recalled quite a bit from my stats classes in college and thereafter the real reason for the delay had to do with me wanting to include information about all those complex mulligan scenarios that I had mentioned in the total draw odds section where maybe you keep x cards and you want the second copy and stuff like that and I was going to make charts for all that stuff but then I realized that it was probably overkill because in reality, there are very few cards we want to have two copies of in our opening hand in any deck, you know? Maybe Chansky, maybe Running Interference, maybe not, you know? So I kind of had to scale this all back a bit. And I want to apologize now to any stats or math majors who are going to look at this video and be like, that dude did not explain it properly at all. Well, you know what? I might agree with you. But what I also want you to remember before you start posting hateful comments is this. We are playing a game with a small deck, which has deck building rules, and we have to make quick pre-game decisions to get things moving. We're not allowed to keep notes during the game or write down anything at all. But what we can do and can remember is quick shorthand reference numbers that are easy to recall and put into practice. So that was the goal of this video, quite honestly. We really, we don't have time to do anything else. So. I've tried to provide those shorthand methods, and I hope that I've done this topic some real justice. That said, thank you all for watching and being patient if this is one that you were waiting for. I kept my schedule this past week, though, so you can't knock me for that. And you should expect another one this Friday, which I'm just starting to get ready to go. Um, and just, just be excited. Just look forward to it, right? Uh, I think it's going to be about uh, the new draft set that we, we just heard about today. All right, Rebels, good night, take care, have fun out there, and may the Force be with you.